Sorry, I just had the strangest feeling. It's like I've been here before. Hi, I'm Abby. I have a lot of records, and this is the Vinyl Monday Woodstock series. So welcome back, or welcome if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the series where once a week I just sit down and talk about records that I love. And right now you are watching the third and final installment in my Woodstock mini-series. So for three weeks now I've talked about the music that went into and came out of the Woodstock Festival. I recommend you go watch parts one and two if you haven't already, then maybe you'll see why I took the direction I did with this episode. And this week we're talking about Deja Vu by supergroup Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Let's take this out of the plastic here. And my copy is an original. The originals are gold on black, and all of the pressings after 1977 are gold on brown. I'm not totally sure why they made this change, but I do like the black faux leather texture that we have going on on this pressing. So the photography for this jacket was done by Henry Diltz and Tom Gundelfinger. <laughs> this photograph is pretty cool. You got Crosby and his mustache right here. The style is very reminiscent of early photography of daguerreotypes and you also have these cut corners on all four sides making it look like it's in a photo album. It's very American which is hilarious seeing as only half this group is American. On Deja Vu you have David Crosby of The Birds, Stephen Stills, of Buffalo Springfield, Graham Nash, originally of the Hollies, sorry, I don't have any Hollies records, I just have songs for beginners, and Neil Young, also of Buffalo Springfield. But right now, at this point in the band's history, he's making some noise for his work with Crazy Horse. I have Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere right here. As the cover art states, you also have Dallas Taylor on the drums and Greg Reeves playing bass on this record. When you open up the gatefold, you have tons and tons of photography of all four of these guys plus Reeves and Taylor. If you hold it lengthwise this way, you get all of the track names and credits. Two of your guests on this record, Taylor and Reeves, are featured pretty prominently on the front of the jacket, but you also have John Sebastian of The Love and Spoonful on this album. He plays the harmonica on the title track Deja Vu, and you also have Jerry fucking Garcia. I had no idea he was on this thing until I did the research for this record. He plays the steel guitar on Teach Your Children. Curiously, we do not know who was playing the piano on this record. I guess nobody at the studio bothered to write it down. Maybe they were all too stoned to remember. I, uh, if I had to guess, it was probably Graham Nash playing the piano, but I mean, it's fun to not know. It's fun to speculate. And as you do when you're keeping it all in the family, Deja Vu was produced by Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young themselves. The road to Deja Vu was a rocky one. So, so many songs were being written for this record, as I'm sure you can imagine from these four, and they were all writing to cope with some pretty tough times. Stephen Stills and his girlfriend, singer Judy Collins, had just broken up, and Graham Nash and his girlfriend, singer Joni Mitchell, were just about to break up. Joni broke up with Graham via a telegram from a trip to Spain, but that is a story for another Vinyl Monday. I guess Graham was in Spain without the S, but by far, David Crosby was having the roughest time of the four. His girlfriend, Christine Hinton, had died in a car crash in 1969 at the age of just 21. Uh, say what you will about Crosby. Um, I do clown on the guy for being dumb enough to cheat on Joni Mitchell, but at the end of the day, he's a fantastic musician. He's 
a really interesting guy and he's certainly been through more than enough tragedy in his lifetime, more than anyone deserves. I cannot imagine going through what he was going through and putting out not one, but two records. That That's certainly a show of superhuman strength and I commend him for that. There was always drama and infighting between the guys of CSNY and, shockingly enough, it wasn't from Graham Nash dating David Crosby's ex. It came from having too many cooks in the kitchen, from having some really big personalities and some really big and stubborn personalities, namely David Crosby and Neil Young. As the story goes, Young would bring his songs in, add the backing vocals, and then take them right away again to mix and master them, which is the most Neil Young thing I've ever heard. He seems like a pretty particular guy. A similarly in-character move was Crosby keeping his vocal take of Almost Cut My Hair just to spite Stills. <laughs> Stills made Nash change the arrangement of Teach Your Children because whatever Baroque pop thing he had going was not meshing with the rest of this material. Songs got rejected over and over and over again. Stills' best estimate of how many takes it took to get the title track right was about a hundred, but Carry On just took one day to hammer out. Eight hours, that's it. And I'm sure that is only scratching the surface of what was going on behind the scenes of Deja Vu. Uh, it was chaotic and Nash stated that he wanted to keep that feeling of unrest and uncertainty onto the finished product. Deja Vu was recorded from the summer of 1969 through January of 1970 in Wally Hader's Studio C and Studio 3 respectively. Each of the guys got two songs on the final track listing. There are two outliers, a Stills Young collaboration, and a certain cover that we're gonna be talking about real soon. So I'm gonna do something a little different while I talk about the track listing this week. I normally don't have my song titles on the screen, but this week we're gonna do that. And I'm gonna color code them by who wrote the song because I, I feel with so many writers on one album, we, we kind of have to do that to keep everybody straight. The red text will be the songs written by Crosby, Yellow is Stills, Green is Nash, and Blue is Young. Um, I'm just gonna have the outliers in white. Side one opens with Carry On. Then we have Teach Your Children, followed by Almost Cut My Hair, then Helpless, and side one closes with Woodstock. Yeah, I bet you see where we're going with this. Oh, I'm so good. Side two opens with the title track, Deja Vu. Then we have Our House, 4 and 20. Then we have Country Girl, which is a medley of three song fragments called Whiskey Boot Hill, Down, 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 and Country Girl, I Think You're Pretty. And the record closes with Everybody, I Love You. All right, so last week, of course, we talked about Joni Mitchell's Woodstock, and this week we get to talk about CSNY's Woodstock. So Joni Mitchell missed Woodstock, but CSNY didn't. Um, of course, Graham Nash was dating Joni Mitchell at the time, and Mitchell wrote the song inspired by Nash and others just gushing to her about how amazing Woodstock was, which to me is just the best way to deal with FOMO ever. CSNY finally took the Woodstock stage at around 3 a.m. on the final day. Remember, the festival ran incredibly late, and Nash described it as both primeval and futuristic. This is what they perform during their Woodstock set. They open their set with Judy Blue Eyes, which was followed by Blackbird, a Beatles cover. Then they played Helplessly Hoping, Guinevere, Marrakesh Express, and Four and Twenty off this record. 
When they played Mr. Soul, Young finally hopped on stage for the rest of the set. He was very nervous about the whole thing. He was nervous about playing with the guys. This was only their second gig ever. He was nervous about the crowd and he was most wary of the documentary crew. He actually refused to go on stage until the cameras were cut. Next, they played Wonderin', followed by You Don't Have to Cry. And for the rest of the set, they plugged in and went electric. They played Pre-Down Roads, Long Time Gone, Bluebird Revisited, Sea of Madness, and they closed their set with Wooden Ships. Uh, they did go back on for an encore in which they played Find the Cost of Freedom and 49 Bye Byes. Aside from the Neil Young camera crew thing, uh, none of the guys really remember the specifics because as Graham Nash stated, that is just how much they smoked that day. And it wasn't their best night. Uh, given having half a million people screaming and cheering at you, it's gonna be pretty hard to stay in key. As for Woodstock, the song. Stills worked out this arrangement while he was playing with Jimi Hendrix. And this groove that you hear on Deja Vu is just about as different from the original as you can get. All four guys recorded their vocals for Woodstock in the booth together, which didn't always happen with the songs on Deja Vu. And Stills overdubbed the back half of his lead vocal because his words, not mine, he was excruciatingly out of tune. It's worth noting the few lyrics they changed. Stills sings gotta get back to the land and set my soul free, instead of gonna camp out on the land, gonna try and get my soul free. I did get it right this time. Uh, it's uh, sorry, it's what happens when you listen to the music and write about the music and film and edit and you're just one person. We also hear the addition of the line, we are million year old carbon in CSNY's Woodstock. Conversely, the line caught in the devil's bargain gets totally buried in this mix. This Woodstock sounds a lot more openly optimistic than Joni Mitchell's recording. There's even more of a dissonance between the peppy driving arrangement and the lyrics which seem as old as mankind themselves. And maybe that's why the CS and Y version was used in the Woodstock film over Joni Mitchell's recording. It fits the sunshiny view of the festival that Michael Wadley and Martin Scorsese want you to have a lot more than Joni's recording. Um, I do, uh-oh, uh-oh, it's breaking. Ah! I talk a little bit about how this Woodstock film has affected our view of Woodstock today in a piece that I wrote on my website called Peace and Love is Dead. I know that is quite an inflammatory title, but hopefully you'll give it a chance and see how it earned that name in the first place. In a 1989 issue of Rolling Stone, Nash said, if you were at Woodstock and you're enthused about it, then you're a 69 hippie, you're to be discounted. But there will never be anything as good as Woodstock because it was the first and the best. I don't think you can recreate that. There was a certain glow about the 60s, a certain naivete and exploration, an excitement for the future that doesn't exist anymore. That's literally what I said in last week's Woodstock episode. That's part of why the 60s fascinate me, man. It was a shit show on the world stage. You had war left and right and this sense of terrifying uncertainty because everyone thought that the world was going to be a cinder block flying through space in a matter of years anyway. But on the Woodstock stage, there was this sense of hope and this earnest belief that with enough peace and love, things really could get better. Graham Nash was totally right. There's this sense of optimism that just doesn't exist anymore. It was that principle of loving everybody openly and letting people into your heart, uh, throwing it back to episode one with that, that's what Janis Joplin embodied so well. Woodstock is a song about a hippie making a pilgrimage, either to the Garden of Eden or to Woodstock 
or the end of the fucking world. And that is what's so beautiful about this song. It can go either and any way. Oddly enough, Graham Nash's quote about Woodstock being futuristic yet primeval describes the production of Joni Mitchell's Woodstock perfectly. It's so open, there's a lot of negative space with just her and the keys. However, on CSNY's Woodstock, there's no open space. It's full and everybody is together. Everybody's coming together to make this thing that's a lot bigger than them. So Deja Vu was released in March of 1970, a whole month before Ladies of the Canyon with Joni's recording of Woodstock on it. And this baby right here sold two million pre-orders, along with, I think, Zeppelin III. This was the most anticipated record of 1970. And speaking of more recent releases, there was this super cool RSD release that I don't have which is all made up of alternate takes and outtakes from the Deja Vu sessions. If anybody has that, let me know in the comments and you tell me what you think. The success of Deja Vu was instrumental for the successes of all four of their solo records that were going to come out after this. Stephen Stills 1, superior to Stephen Stills 2, if you know, you know. If I Could Only Remember My Name, which sadly I don't have here. Songs for Beginners, which I do have, as well as After the Gold Rush. And if anything's for sure about Deja Vu, it is that it's had an immense legacy. Um, my mom was born in August of 1969, and this is her favorite record. Uh, when I told her I was going to be filming this today, uh, she said one word, and that was awesome. <laughs> she tells me about this. She would peel the wallpaper back in her childhood bedroom and write the lyrics from the Deja Vu record on her walls. And I also have some thoughts from my friend McKenna. I caught her for this at just the right time, seeing as she saw Graham Nash live not too long ago. So uh, being a much better music writer than me, I had her write up a little something for this video and I'm gonna read it right now. Oh, I'm gonna have to make this text pitifully large because I am blind. So these are our words from McKenna. Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young's Deja Vu is nearly impossible to describe. It's more than an album, more than a feeling. It's the taste of warm apple pie baked with love or the feel of a soft summer evening breeze caressing your hair. It's a tight hug from your favorite person or a shoulder to cry on. It's warmth, it's reassurance, it's love, and at its core, it's life. That's the beauty of deja vu to me. There are no flashing lights or glittering costumes, no outrageous guitar solos or pyrotechnics. It's not rooted in entertainment or performance, but in expression and humanity. It's about the life all of us lead from love and loss to jubilation and melancholy. Deja Vu captures the essence of the everyday and turns it into something extraordinarily beautiful. From delicate flowers resting in a vase, to the relationship between parent and child, to grappling with self-expression, to love. Deja Vu's power lies in its simplicity and I love it so. It is one of the most emotionally potent works I've ever encountered. The moment the needle drops, tears well in my eyes while a smile tugs at my mouth. Even over half a century after its release, I find something new to love about it every single day. It's as if Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young are singing directly into my soul. Thank you so much, McKenna, for your contribution to this video and for such an incredible summary of the, the feeling of deja vu. Not the feeling of actual deja vu strange. It's like I've been here before. So after sharing my mom's memories of Deja Vu and McKenna's thoughts about it, it's time to get into my thoughts. It is so, so rare that you get two equally proficient songwriters in a group, let alone more. Um, to put this into perspective, the Beatles had three. They had Lennon, McCartney, and Harrison. 
Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young has fucking four. Now that is a super group. I feel like if your group put together is more famous than all of their original groups were, then you absolutely deserve to be called a super group. And these guys deserve it. It's also really tough to have more than one big personality in a group, like Lennon and McCartney, or David Crosby and Neil Young. When I was first listening to this album, I was getting super excited to get into other stuff by this producer. Um, I love producers and I love really good production work. And then I was shocked to learn that the producers were Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Having an artist produce their own records, uh, it can go either way. You either have Jimmy Page producing the Zeppelin records, or you have John Fogarty producing Willie and the Poor Boys. Artists often need producers to be their fresh set of ears, because as an artist you get really attached to what you do because you hear it over and over and over and over again. With CSNY, they were all each other's fresh set of ears, and I think that's why they worked so well with producing Deja Vu. Their attention to detail is insane. Goddamn can Stephen Stills write an opener. Between Judy Blue Eyes on CSN and Carry On here, just wow. Which do I prefer? Um, I get Judy Blue Eyes stuck in my head more, but the back half, that second movement of Carry On, is one of the coolest things ever. The organization of this record is deliberate and it's perfect. With those first four tracks, remember, Carry On, Teach Your Children, Almost Cut My Hair, and Helpless. You get a perfect introduction of all four players with those four songs. If you know these musicians well, all of these songs are unmistakably them. Carry On with all of those vocal harmonies really packed together, that is Stephen Stills. Almost Cut My Hair, the dramatic guitar, that is David Crosby. The vocal harmonies on this record are impeccable, as to be expected from these guys, but they are the tightest on the title track on Deja Vu. I see why it took like a hundred takes, with all those notes being so close together, so densely packed, uh, with the chord changes, with the syncopation, if somebody is even slightly off or a little bit out of tune, the whole thing will go to sh**. I adored our house to begin with, and I adored it even more when I learned that it was about Graham Nash and Joni Mitchell's house together. 4 and 20 surprised me. I hadn't really given the back half of this record as much attention as I did the front when I was like casually listening to it, but when I started really getting into it for this record, um, I remember I was getting ready for the Janus Vinyl Monday, uh, and 4 and 20 came on, and it just stopped me dead in my tracks. I dropped everything I was doing, I listened to the song, and then I did something I never do when we're listening to an album from front to back for Vinyl Monday. I replayed 4 and 20. That's how much it sort of took me. Uh, it's dark and I had no idea about the darkness going on in everybody's personal lives when Deja Vu was being made. Just like Stephen Stills hit it out of the park with Carry On, the opener, Neil Young really, really did a great closer with Country Girl. I mean, what a sweet. And then comes Everybody I Love You. It feels like Stills and Young came up with Everybody I Love You and didn't really know where else on the track listing it should go, so they were like, oh hell, why don't we just put it on the end? <sighs> SOS, I am out of water. In the end, Deja Vu was about four guys all coming together and devoting themselves to something bigger than them. It's like a quilt of everybody's trauma that they patched together and made something cozy and useful and beautiful out of it. That's what all of the Woodstock generation was doing, and Woodstock, the song, was a microcosm of that. It's a showcase of four equally talented songwriters 
something that we haven't seen before and I don't think we've seen since. Deja vu is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Sorry, I just had the strangest feeling. It's like I've been here before. My personal favorites are Carry On, Almost Cut My Hair, Deja Vu, Our House, and Four and Twenty. And that is the final installment of the Vinyl Monday Woodstock series. What do you think of Deja Vu and Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young? You should leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you have to say about the music I like. Yeah, wow, after this comes the big one. Uh, I'm kind of scared for that, honestly. It's been quite the undertaking. But if you want to see the big one and you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11 a.m. What can I say about the big one? Um, buckle up, get ready. Thank you so much for watching and I really hope that I will see you guys next week for the big one. Bye.